Okay, so um, since we have limited time today, I think we should just get started. So thank you for everyone for coming today and welcome to our panel on careers in the European Commission, where we'll be talking specifically about traineeships in the European Commission. Um, so thank you to our speakers for taking the time to be here and talk to us today. Um, we're really looking forward to having you and thank you for all of our members for attending. Um, exactly. So. Um, we, you guys all know who we are, we're the European Society here at LSE, and um, this is sort of one of the panels in a series of events that we're organizing um, on careers in the European Union, um, and yes, we're very excited for everyone to be here today. So I'll briefly introduce um, our speakers, and then I'll hand it over to Laura, who is our careers director, who will then start with the questions. Um, in terms of the format for the event itself, we'll have around 14 minutes where we'll have um, Laura asking the panelists some questions and they will be answering. And then the last 20 minutes will be dedicated to question and answers from the audience. So please feel free to post any of your questions in the chat and we'll go through those um, in the remaining 20 minutes um, for our speakers and panelists to, to answer those for you. Uh, exactly, so joining us today, we have uh, Frank, Francesca, who um, did uh, her Blue Book traineeship at the Director General Santé. Um, and then we have Roberts, who did his, or is currently doing his Blue Book traineeship in the cabinet of the Executive Vice President of the European Commission for an economy that works for the people. Then we have Nikos, who, um, and Roberts and Nikos and Isola are all LSE alumni from the European Institute. So we're all excited to have our strong alumni network working for us today. Um, and Nikos, he, um, is currently a trainee at the Cabinet of Vice President um, in the European Commission working within the Health and Green Deal portfolios. And then Isola is a um, trainee um, in the European, in the Director General, Director General for Employment um, and in currently working on infringement proceedings in the field of labor law. So thank you all for coming today and we're really excited for your insight. Um, and I'll hand it over to Laura to start with the questions. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you everyone for coming. We're excited to have you all here. Um, so I'll kick it off with the first question, um, and that is to, I'm asking all panelists to introduce themselves, um, their academic background, and a little bit of the um, of their role in the institution that they're working in right now. Um, so maybe, Roberts, do you want to start? Sure, yes. Um, yeah, thank you for, for uh, inviting me to take part in this panel. It's uh, great to, to kind of, for, for the first time now, integrate into the LSD alumni um, community. So it's, it's a yeah, pleasure for me. Um, I'm from Latvia. Uh, I, I attended Stanford University for my bachelor's degree. I studied, in philo studied philosophy and religious studies. Um, and then last year, I did uh, political economy of Europe at the European Institute at LSC. And currently I'm working as a trainee in the cabinet of executive vice president for an economy that works for people, Valdis Dombrovskis, um, who's also from Latvia. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, Nick, do you wanna continue? Thank you, Laura. Uh, so it's, uh, I just wanna say how happy I am to be here to share my experiences with everyone. This is my first event and as an LSC alum. So I'm really happy to contribute to the next generations of students and alumni at LSE as well. So I'm from Greece. I did my undergraduate in international relations in the UK at the University of Surrey. And then I did the, the European International Public Policy degree uh, at the European Institute in LSE. So currently I am uh, at the cabinet of Vice President Margaritis Kinas, who like Roberts is also the same nationality as myself. So he's Greek. Um, so his portfolio is promoting our European way of life, but specifically within it, I'm working in the health and green deal portfolios because they need all hands on deck on those two areas because they're very, very busy. Thank you. Um, Isola? Yes, thank you for the invitation. As Roberts and Nikos, I, this is also my first event as an alum, so I'm happy to be here. And um, so yeah, I've done my bachelor and master in law in Italy from the University of Bologna. 
Then I went on to work a bit for a year before joining LSE, the uh, same program as Nikos, so European and International Public Policy at the European Institute. And yes, this November, so I've been at the Commission for 15 days now, not very long. I joined DG Employment, uh, where I'm currently working mostly in um, the field of labor law and uh, dealing with infringement proceedings uh, towards member states. Thank you, and Frankie? So hi everyone, uh, very nice to be here. I'm a little bit the outsider. I've never been in LSE, I've never attended it. Uh, I actually come from Rome and uh, I did also a low master's degree in uh, La Sapienza. I don't know if you know it. And then uh, a little bit of uh, abroad exchanges during the academic years. Afterwards, I did um, fundraising for nonprofit uh, uh, specialization course. And after that, I did a master in uh, economics and management of arts and culture. So to say, yeah, cultural heritage. And uh, after that, I, I joined the uh, Brussels area and the, the commission with the blue book in the director general uh, for Santé, so health and food security. And after that, I worked a little bit um, as, a, as a collaborator of an MEP. So I was uh, with the MEP from, um, from the ITRE committee, Ms. Toya. And after that, I started actually working with the director general, within the director general uh, for education and culture. And that's uh, why right now, right now I'm actually a desk officer for the Erasmus and Coordination Unit. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move on to the traineeship scheme itself. Um, could you please elaborate on the scheme that you are participating in or, or have participated in um, in the past, um, what it offers, how exactly it works, um, and is it useful to um, anyone who, wa who wants to work in the institution later in life or in any other institutions maybe similar to that? Um, we can start with Nick this time. Thanks, Laura. Um, so in terms of the Blue Book Commission, people come here for one or two, one of two reasons. So number one, either you would like to pursue a career within the European institutions. And this is perhaps one of the best steps to take alongside the Schumann internship, which is the equivalent one in the parliament in terms of getting some experience where just when you get comfortable, you have to, to stop your traineeship and then you have to decide what it is you want to be. And then there's the other reason, whereas if you would like to go, for instance, to work in the private sector, but you would also like to have an idea of how it is to work uh, within the European Union and especially the executive of the EU, the Blue Book traineeship is for you. It's, it's a bit addictive once you come to, to Brussels and especially in the Blue Book traineeship because you, for all of us that in one way or another have a passion for studying the EU, uh, it's, it's quite remarkable and fascinating to see to see the EU work before your eyes, and especially in the cabinets where Roberts and myself work, uh, I think you would agree that we're actually seeing how the EU legislates and creates policies on this level. Um, in terms of what you would expect, so you're a very high level administrative assistant. We don't really have job descriptions, and the only attitude that you should really bring is that you, you're willing to do anything and everything they put on your plate, if you don't know it, then that's too bad. You're going to have to learn it and you're going to have to, to work with that. For instance, I had never dealt with health policy until I came to the commission a month and a half ago in early October. And yet now I'm working in that aspect of EU legislation. So the commission is very much, it, it thinks like a private entity. It thinks like a private corporation, even though it is uh, a part of the public sector, so to speak. So you should look at it as just a very, very high level job, just equivalent to the private sector. The standards are no different. They're not lower or anything. If anything, they're a bit higher because they also want to maintain a bit of a standard. And what you also realize is that there's a lot of competition between the institutions and between the DGs within the, uh, the commission for competition of talent acquisition. So they want the best of you. You have to give that to them. And I'm sure that if you do, and if you try to connect 
everything you do to the European Union and how you can learn and develop from it, then the Blue Book traineeship is definitely the place for you to go. Thank you very much for that. Um, Frankie, do you want to comment on it since that's something that you've been through uh, or you, that you went through a year ago? Absolutely. So I agree with Nick uh, about the fact that it's absolutely something useful and interesting to do, whether you want to work within or outside afterwards, uh, the, the institutions. Something um, so on the general uh, traineeship scheme, you can actually do two kind of uh, so actually talking about the application itself, you can do an administrative type or also a translate, uh, translator type of traineeship. Of course, here, I think we're all uh, from the administrative uh, side. And that's uh, when he says that there's actually no job description, it really means that it depends on the kind of unit you are going to end up with, the kind of job you will do. So sometimes it could be actually support for uh, event organization. It could be coordination, coordination for example, on uh, external or internal communication. You can uh, do drafting of briefings most of the time. So when you come to more policy kind of units, you, you end up doing lots of briefings, lots of um, uh, concept notes, for example, for your hierarchy. And that's also the way that you, you learn and you, you see through all the process for the, how, how the politics is being made, so to say, or how the policies are being made. And, um, and for the rest, uh, sometimes instead, when he was saying, for example, on the other side, if you want to work for uh, the private sector afterwards, when he was referring, for example, to the executive agencies, that's usually when you see a little bit more closely how the uh, program management is done. So you learn a lot about how general selection and calls and project management is being, is being followed. And, um, and yeah, so that depends a little bit on what you want to do for afterwards, but generally wherever you end up uh, uh, working, it's definitely an added value to your CV. Okay, thank you. Isola? Uh, yes, I want to comment on what Francesca said about uh, how different units are uh, from each other. So I'd say start researching the DG you're interested in and the unit perhaps also because something that from the outside might seem completely unrelated to, to what you're interested in and what your study is, I think that can be really surprising. I'm speaking for experience. When I got contacted by the unit working conditions at DG Employment, I didn't think it was really fitting my experience, but in the end, my unit only does legal research and legal proceedings. So that's something from that from the outside you don't really get until you like research, go to a website, maybe reach out to people that have done the traineeship. And on this, like the LSE is really, really rich in the um, alumni uh, website and also, and Clinton from the career service is really, really helpful on that side. So. I'd say open your um, your horizons because when you apply, usually everyone applies for the same DGEs like DG Trade, the fancy ones. But even in DGEs that are not considered, there is something that can be like good for you and good for your profile. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, Roberts, do you have a different experience or do you agree? I agree. Yes, definitely. With with most that has been said, I think I, I um, Nikos made the comparison of of uh, how in many ways how the commission works it, it does resemble also how you know private uh, you know well run companies would work. For me, what's been interesting also is is the kind of more the political aspect and in some senses which, which in which I think working in a cabinet has been very different than any other professional experience I've had so far. Um, you know these things for example if your commissioner is having has a, an event that they have to partake in uh, and how everyone in the cabinet gets involved in preparing briefings and commenting quickly and these very short deadlines and this kind of sense of urgency of, of having you know a complete material for the 
the, 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 the commissioner or the, the executive vice president or, or for them when they when they're speaking that yeah that they are that they have all the information that's necessary and likewise also when there are interviews you know that, that the, they're in the best possible you know kind of position when they participate that aspect for me has been very fascinating and I think uh, yeah many of these many of these ex experiences definitely I think they, they give you kind of insight in general how politics even outside of the commission works uh, and what it means to be a, a policy analyst or a member in, in the politicians team or something like that. Thank you, thank you very much. I really like that you mentioned the short deadlines. Um, maybe LSC does prepare you well for that type of career. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next question. I would like you to take us through your day. Um, what tasks do you have on the table? What are your responsibilities? Um, maybe if you've already done some exciting projects, um, what were they like? Uh, what's been your favorite so far? Um, we can start with Isola. Yes, um, I think that really depends uh, from today, at least from my experience. Uh, it's only been two weeks again, but uh, it can really change. Uh, some days I participate in meetings uh, from the parliament where I have to take notes and uh, then brief with my colleagues or maybe some days I have meetings with only my colleagues when we discuss things and we set out our next deadlines. And some other days I just work on myself, maybe exchanging few mails, email, emails with uh, my colleagues to ask for stuff. but. Uh, so that, that, that is really um, varied, I think. And when, personally, when I'm working alone, I usually go through legal cases. I read a lot and then prepare drafts, prefer briefings for my colleagues. Um, and I'd say that at least for my experience, uh, colleagues and units are very keen on giving you things despite being like remotely which of course I think it won't be the case when many of you probably will apply, but um, people are really keen on giving you stuff to do despite like us only the beginning because they really need the help. Mm -hmm. um, Francesca? I was choosing if uh, to tell you a little bit about the Blue Book experience or what happens next, so to say. But yeah, generally my blue, my blue Book day, work day was a little bit more similar to the one that Isola had because I was also in the legal affairs uh, team from uh, DG Health. And uh, that was definitely a little bit more concerning the drafts of uh, the, the chaps, so the complaints that we were actually receiving and trying to prepare the basis doing the legal research and then prepare the basis for the colleagues uh, who are actually the lawyers or maybe send the documents to the to the um, uh, service juridique uh, to, 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 to represent then, of course, afterwards uh, the EU in front of the court. Uh, some other times it was just about uh, exchanging documents or super supervising some internal inter-service communication. That's also something super, super useful. You understand a little bit the point of view of uh, the different DGs. And then, uh, for example, a very interesting moment was uh, when you, uh, when you, for example, when you follow these uh, these complaints, these uh, chaps procedures. What happens is that you may find yourself in front of the the meeting with the with the with doing the dialogues with the member states before they 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 might open an infringement procedure. So that's something that's um, a little bit exciting that you can find yourself in. Whereas uh, as desk officer, that's a whole other kind of experience. Um, you, I am actually uh, the contact point for the national agencies that implement the Erasmus program. So that means to actually be coordinating all the passages or the life cycle of the, of the projects and the, the program itself. Right now we're in the transitioning moment. So of course we're going towards the next seven years of the program and that entails lots of different little little tasks so we and right now we basically follow day by day everything that, that is happening towards the process and uh, as well as um, to prepare the national agencies for these new steps thank you very much um nick thank you laura also i think next time roberts should be first because twice we put him last um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so in terms of the daily routine of the cabinets, 
So they do differ a little bit uh, from the daily work of the of the DGs in, in one thing. So in the cabinets, if you want a more political experience, then that's where you should see to it that you go. Because uh, so for instance, where I work, the DGs, uh, so for instance, DG Sante sends the, um, uh, any proposal on any health related legislation, they send it to cabinet Kyriakidis, which is for uh, related to health proposals. And through that, they send it to us in the vice president. And then we all discuss it. So the cabinets amongst ourselves in terms of what are the political issues that, that you have to, to be careful for when you're proposing each recommendation or directive or regulation, whatever it is. And our work usually is uh, preparing the, the commissioner in terms of what is the relevance for the national country that they're representing? What is the relevance for their portfolio? What should be changed, if anything? Is there something that they should be careful for? And you just constantly write these reports. Um, I, I don't remember who, who mentioned it, but LSE does very much help in that respect. There were a lot of assignments last year where I just looked at myself and I'm like, why, why am I doing that? So I remember specifically for EU 490 evidence and analysis and policy making, I hated that subject. I had to do a critique and then a proposal for an ex post evaluation of the cohesion policy for, uh, for the 2014 2020 MFF. And yet, the first thing that they gave me to do when I came here was to read through an ex post evaluation of a policy and analyze it. So there's a lot of these things, a lot of these reports that you do at LSC. Uh, where you're not quite sure why you're doing them, a lot of intense deadlines, and all of that is extremely relevant for a job like the Blue Book traineeship. And in your daily, daily life, everything that you use, and it's not just uh, knowledge that you have, it's about how you think, your critical thinking toolbox, and everything that LSE teaches you that pushes you in your daily routine to, to excel as much as you can. And in terms of that, I think... Uh, I think that's that's what your daily routine uh, focuses on. And to mention quickly, one of the favorite moments I had, I think, um, so last week, the commission proposed the new European health union. And it was actually very remarkable to witness that in times of crisis, the EU did, uh, did step forward and did take the big moment to try to do something that's good for, for all European citizens, EU and non-EU people alike. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, Robert, I will make sure to put you first in the next rounds. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, in terms of the daily life, uh, for me, I would say there's two constants, which every single day I, I go through. One thing is at the 8.50, there's a cabinet call um, that all members join, and it's basically going through the news, kind of what's happening, what is relevant, you know, what uh, in you know what what everyone has to be aware, and when the commission then is speaking to the public, what are some lines that kind of from when it when it, what concerns trade or uh, economic policy more broadly? What you know? How do we approach this? So that's always very fascinating to just listen in and and kind of hear how yeah these very you know, uh, senior EU uh, officials kind of think through new developments and, and, and how it's unfolding. And then the second thing, which also Elsie prepared me perfectly for, is that there's these midday briefings, which the commission holds every day. And kind of, it, the, for in, in our cabinet, the, one of the trainees always has to follow it and take notes diligently and then send them out to um, the rest of the cabinet. So, and in addition to that, the, there's usually, uh, I don't know, two, three kind of long-term, so to say, <laughs> long-term, but meaning basically three, four day projects. You know, maybe there's an event that the, 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 the EVP um, is uh, participating in and uh, you have, you, you have received a kind of very extensive policy briefing from I don't know, say DG ECFIN or DG FISMO or DG Trade, and you have to find from all this information what what specifically answers kind of the questions that uh, the hosts of this event um, are asking for. So also from LSC studies where you have to 
answer precisely the question you know that is being asked uh perfect so um yeah i think i feel like those things uh especially yes when, th when there is a short deadline and there is this adrenaline to kind of you know get it done uh quickly i think though some of those um experiences have been the most uh yeah exciting and 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 um uh, beneficial for me so far Okay, thank you, Robert. Um, we're now going to move to the second part of this event, which is about the application process. Um, and then we're going to take um, some questions from the participants. Um, I'm going to ask Frankie, I know it's been a while since you've been through the application process, but if you can remember, um, what was the application process like? What did it require? And why did you apply for your specific role? So, okay, so... Um... In general, it depends on when you apply for it. Uh, sometimes you have to do it multiple times. So you can go from the, for the period that is during the summer. If I'm not wrong, it should be between uh, July and August. And that goes for the selection period that is uh, around uh, the fall. And then you start in March. Uh, so always make sure that you follow the deadlines and that uh, you're going to send the, the application definitely some days before because the system always cracks down. So please do it before at least two, three days before the before the deadline, the submission deadline. And then, uh, so generally, um, as we said, there's no specific role. So you say administrative traineeship or trans uh, translation traineeship. And, uh, and then you decide a little bit of the kind of DG where you want to steer the attention to, but then again, it's a little bit of a database uh, kind of selection and it really depends on how good you are in networking and lobbying and if they have the, already picked someone or not. So, that, so what happens basically is that you, you send the application, you wait some, uh, some, uh, some months some, some, some months actually to know if you have been pre-selected. When that happens, you finally re receive an email. Sometimes they tell you that your, your application unfortunately is under the threshold and you don't have to take it personally. That's actually something that happens quite, it's quite um, common to happen. And um, it, it also depends a lot on the quotas that you, we receive per country. So, for example, for Italians, they're usually quite a problem because we are the one that send the most uh, the applications. So, it's uh, if you get in, it's it's really good job usually. That's what they tell you afterwards. Uh, then you have this moment that is called the eligibility check, and so you are supposed to send the supporting documents. And uh, actually, you will have the uh, um, let's say spread out around the, the institution, people checking for your profile, of course, corresponding to a certain kind of grades, assessment grades that they receive. And then there's going to be a final check from the traineeship office. I actually worked at my first uh, interim job, my first experience after the blue book was in the traineeship office from DGX. So please hit me with a question, I will tell you what happens beside, behind that. Um, what happens next, if you finally receive the emails telling you, okay, you are, you are among the selected candidates, it means only that you are in the reserve list. And that's when the real job starts. Apart from what Isola said before, that you should definitely uh, study a little bit before all the DGs and, of course, uh, write down in the motivational letters everything that steers a little bit their attention to what you like, but also what tells them that you're a good match for them, for their services. Uh, after when you get in the reserve list, so you really need to be lobbying, read whatever you can find, who is who, the organigram is open for everyone. So that's a public source where you actually find out the names of the head of units of all the policy officers. And uh, you basically send uh, spontaneous applications. So it's uh, in that sense, it's not that different from what would you do as a normal postgrad uh, to, to try to find a job. And um, and then you go on and you hope that they, that they will call you. <laughs> That's basically what happens. Thank you very much. Um, Robert, do you have the same experience? Um, and why did you ap apply for your role? Uh, well, uh, the, the reason why I, why I applied to my role, I listed basically as the first DGs that I would most be interested in working would be DG ECFIN, DG FISMA. Uh, and then I also listed cabinets. The main reason was because uh, having done the European political economy uh, program, it seemed that those are the most kind of uh, 
yeah, like those are the DGs that most directly uh, do policy work that relates to, to what I had studied. Um, and yeah, and then after kind of the, describing my, my studies, why it relates, uh, the, then there was, I think, like a three month basically period when uh, we didn't hear anything. And I think it wasn't sh completely clear for the traineeship office if the, if the traineeship will happen or not. And then, and then I remember, yes, uh, during summer, basically right when I found out that I got into the reserve list and I was contacted if, if I would be interested in, in uh, working in this cabinet of Valdis Dombrovskis. Um, I did not do any kind of lobbying, but I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I think a, a fortunate thing on some, definitely that, uh, that, um, so to say the Latvian commissioner was in charge of precisely kind of the things that I wanted to do. Uh, and because I do think definitely for cabinets, I think there's there's definitely an advantage if you can speak the language that the commission, you know, from, from of the country that the commissioner is coming from, because a lot of the work does involve also communicating with the press and, and having events that, uh, that take place in, in the country uh, that the commissioner is representing. So I think it was very fortunate that kind of my background and nationality and what I had studied aligned uh, so that so that I could yeah get this specific uh, post. Thank you. Um, Isola. Yeah, um, as far as as my concern, um, I always saw the uh, European Commission traineeship as sort of the pathway to perhaps later on deciding whether to stay in the public sector or switch to this private sector. So I had my eyes on it for this particular reason. I had the uh, preferences in other three DGs, but uh, this session, I think everyone can confirm, has been really weird because March trainees got the opportunity to come back in October, which is an exceptional circumstance because if you do more than six weeks in the European institutions, you're not allowed to have any other traineeship in any of them. Um, so for me, the lobbying process was kind of delayed because I got to lobby uh, in July and then everybody told me, no, we're keeping our trainee. And when I lost hopes, I got contacted uh, by the DG employment out of the blue and DG employment, as I've said, is not, were not, was not even a DG I considered. So I kind of got lucky um, in that sense, but overall, um, I, I surely hope that now that COVID at least is not new anymore, the commission will be more prepared to deal with trainees. So I say, I'd say that lobbying and that's procedure that uh, the other explained should be followed strictly. Uh, also in the sense, uh, again, the European um, Institute Career Service, Anne Clinton, uh, really has a lot of materials. I reached out to her in July asking her for advice and she sent me um, a lot of links and documents to read and to study in order to know how to lobby better. Uh, so please refer really to the career services uh, at LSE because they really know what to do. And a tip for the application process, uh, please, when you do the application, ask straight away if you have work experience, please ask your former employers for a letter of recommendation that this letter should list the dates you started, what were your uh, duties and what day you finished because if you get pre-selected then you have I think two weeks three weeks not very long time to upload the documents so in any case prepare yourself so if you get pre-selected you have everything you, you submit them and then you you just wait and if you have everything there shouldn't be any problem with getting into the reserve list Thank you for your practical advice. Um, Nick, what about you? Uh, so I agree with what everyone said. Uh, so in terms of um, a bit more concrete about the application process. So you have a very, very, very limited 
word count. And within that word count, uh, it's sort of like uh, an extended business card, if you will. You, you have to persuade uh, a very competitive institution that they should take you. So don't just list your entire CV in the questions that they ask you. Don't just try to, to show off your knowledge. Consider that everyone that you're competing against is better than you. Now, if you take that assumption, then you have to show HR or whoever is reading your, um, your application, what have you learned uh, from each of your experiences and how that reflects on you as a young professional. Mind you, we're, uh, we're all relatively young, uh, young people in our uh, early, mid, late 20s, but we're all pretty much from similar backgrounds. So what makes you stand out? You have, you have to think about it. Now that should be connected to where you're thinking of applying. So for instance, I knew that I didn't want a technical experience. I wanted a political experience. So I put cabinets as my first choice, the Secretariat General as my second, and the External Action Service as the third. So I tried to cater my, um, my application to those. In terms of, so that's one part. Now the second part is lobbying. In, in, in the lobbying, don't just send your email and say, this is my CV, you know, like I'm interested. Try, try to build actual concrete relations with some of the people where you're genuinely interested in working for. And the LSC, especially the European Institute in that respect is perhaps one of the best places that you would want to be together with CNSPO and College of Europe because they are like small academies for EU technocrats. And there's so many events of people from the commission, from other institutions that you constantly have a pool of people that you can introduce yourself, yourselves to and, and try to, to network with them. Now, they may not be the person that you want uh, to work for or in the DG or whatever agency that you want to work for, but they may know someone that may help you, for instance. And it's not, it's not, about, it's, it's not about corruption or nepotism. It's 100% about trying to network. If they won't just take you because uh, you, you walked up to them. They will take you because they see something in you. Now you have to give them something to see. You have to give them something to, to pursue after you. Because like I said, in terms of talent acquisition, they think like, the, like a private entity because in terms of talent, they sort of are. So try, try to push to build concrete relationships, try to connect that in tandem with your application, make it personalized, give it time. So don't just do it do it last minute. It's, it's not like some assignment formative that uh, does not matter. If you genuinely want it, do it. And one final thing, because I had a lot of friends that did the blue book application, they're like, yeah, you know what? I, I don't really care. I'll just have it as a backup. And this was before Corona. And then when they realized what transpired after Corona and how some of us that actually uh, got accepted into the commission had a great opportunity, like they sort of regret because they didn't put the emphasis and the effort that they would have wanted to. So if you if you actually commit to do it, do it properly, do it timely, and make sure that you put the proper due diligence for it. Thank you very much for that. Um, some of you have already touched upon some recommendations um, on what to focus on in the application process. So I'm going to give uh, the last question before uh, giving the floor to our attendees. Um, so what are you, what are your recommendations as to, for example, what students can get involved in while at university to strengthen um, their application and to gain those necessary skills for the job? Um, Frankie, would you mind going first? So yeah, definitely apart from the networking skills, as we said, I would definitely recommend you to get involved in whatever kind of organization or activity uh, you can follow in your academic path or also outside and try to take lots of responsibilities within it. Because with that, you can actually improve your coordinated skills, your communication skills in general. And, uh, and also another very, very important thing I would say is the languages. So it's true that usually, and a little bit depending on the units, but usually English is the spoken language. Uh, but um, there are units where you actually end up uh, speaking, speaking only in French, 
German a little bit less, but uh, it may happen. Uh, so I would say that that's definitely a good moment during your university's years to, to do lots of tandems, to do lots of exchanges abroad, or, or in general, try to, to really improve those skills because uh, they're going to come, uh, they're going to be very, very useful when you are uh, within the institutions afterwards. And they can pick you for that. That could be definitely one of the differences why you get selected for a cabinet tour or something else. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, I think if if you get involved in uh, student organizations that really interest you uh, and which have also a kind of a policy element, I think that definitely can be an asset when you are trying to explain why a particular D, for a particular DG, why really you are someone who is deeply committed because, because it's one thing to say, yes, I've taken classes, uh, I've read about it, it's something that I'm passionate about, but if you really can show some kind of evidence of commitment to some policy area that, you know, is, is maybe, you know, you know, so to say more focused, I think, uh, yeah, that can definitely also be a way how you can strengthen your uh, application. Thank you very much. Um, Nick, any tips? Mm, other than, um, so what, what, I pre what I said for the previous question and what uh, was mentioned just now, I think uh, I agree with the, with the Roberts 100% in terms of try to find something that's uh, relevant. So 100% it's important to have things that interest you. So for instance, I had uh, I was president and coach of my boxing society, but I was also in MUN. I was in the youth movement of the European People's Party. I worked uh, with the European Youth Forum and I had all these things that were very relevant for, for what I was doing. And then exactly like Robert said, you pull these things together with your academics. You'll see that in your application, your, your academic experience should almost almost be secondary to your professional. They, they don't want people that have worked too much because that means that their mind is already molded. That means that they're not quite for, for the blue book. They want people that have some experience, but they don't quite have a professional identity yet. But you need to, to try to get involved. For instance, MUN is, uh, is a great way for the EU or, or like uh, the European youth, for instance, there's the Young European Federalists, there's the European Youth Forum, there is uh, dozens upon dozens of NGOs and youth organizations and student organizations that can get you involved with something that is relevant. And then if you just draw that line, that one sentence, one, two sentences, where you can connect the analytic and academic part of your CV to the more practical one, that's what they want for the Blue Book. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, Caroline says in the chat that the joining the European Society is one way to go. I completely agree. Um, and now I'm going to give um, floor to Isola to answer the last question from me. Yeah, I really can add much to what everyone has said, uh, except for if you don't have uh, work experience, uh, because I see a question on the on the chat and. Uh, what counts for work experience in the commission um, as a specific standard. This should be longer than, I'd say six, six weeks, but I'm not sure. So please check on the European Commission website. But if you don't have that kind of experience already, and I'd say it's really important to get some. So on the Career Hub uh, Services uh, website, there are lots of um, part-time jobs that you can take. And now that everything is remote, it's, I think, even more compatible with studying and even a master or an under undergrad, last year undergrad. Um, so even doing something part time that interests you and uh, like to which you're passionate about and can complete your profile, uh, I think that can really give you the skills for the traineeship, like having tasks, like office work that is really something that can help you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, now we're going to give the floor to our attendees. Um, we have the first question by Adriana. Do you wanna ask the question yourself? Um, yes, sure. So first of all, thank you so much for what you've presented so far. And like for me personally, um, 
I'm interested in what you think about the progression or the overall nature of the traineeship. Like, do you remember it and, you know, like positively, um, was the experience enjoyable or were there like long working hours you didn't have time to sleep? And yeah, I, I think I'm really interested in that. Um, is there anyone who wants to answer first? Um, Could I speak because I was the only one actually doing the traineeship uh, outside of Corona times? Uh, enjoying, <laughs> would you say so? Okay, no, in general, you can of course enjoy it uh, also in lockdown and everything, but uh, I mean, the experience is amazing. Uh, we already covered all the work, uh, the work environment parts, so to say. So of course, like learning how to deliver amazing high quality kind of work and uh, always being in touch with amazing colleagues. Uh, you, you really learn every, every day so much from them. But in terms of really like the friendship you make during the traineeship and um, all the kind of activities you can get in uh, involved in, uh, of course, also like the subcommittees, I'm pretty sure that the traineeship right now are also involved in training and subcommittees or something has been done uh, for these sessions uh, during lockdown. Uh, it's really something where you, it, there are those occasions where you can really find people that are going to be your, your next, I mean, your following uh, year's uh, colleagues. So that is amazing. And then something that usually happens when there's no coronavirus itself, it's, uh, it's Plux, which I mean, we haven't, we haven't mentioned it yet, but uh, I mean, Plux is important. Plux is the acronym for the Place de Luxembourg, which is actually the, our kindergarten, so to say. It's where you, you take the beers after work and when you go out from the institution, especially on the Thursday, which means that your MEP usually has already left. And all the trainees uh, meet there around uh, seven or uh, six or whenever you actually get off uh, the, the office. And um, magic happens there. We can say that. Thank you very much. Um, we have quite a few questions. So I think I'm going to move on to the next one if you're OK with that. Um, so Nina, do you want to ask your question yourself or do you want us to? Um, yeah, so my question was what surprised you the most about your experience and like what was the most unexpected thing and possibly also like both positive and negative. Thank you. Um, maybe Roberts. Uh, yes, well, so um, I'm positive. I think I've been very, very impressed definitely with the, my colleagues, how well versed they are in so many policy areas. One thing is just specifically what, what kind of relates to their direct responsibilities and portfolio, but in general about, uh, yes, European Union and, and world affairs, I think it's it's been very, very beneficial to, to simply listen to them. Uh, yes, there's been a, a, very much I, I, I've been able to learn from it. Uh, the more, I think, the most negative thing, I think, has been simply what, you know, what relates to, uh, you know, corona kind of restrictions and just being kind of, you know, locked in in your room and not being able to be in the office and kind of develop relationships that way. Uh, and then I think also kind of touching on the previous question, I, I don't know, so far I would even put it as a positive, but I think at least in the cabinets, there is a bit of a kind of workaholic um, work culture. And for, for, I feel like two, three, four, five months, it's exciting that uh, you get emails at nine o'clock that there's this thing that we have tomorrow <laughs> and like who can check this and that. But uh, yeah, I think if one really commits to doing this for you know their whole life i mean it does come with some cost but but there's also i mean a lot of excitement with it um so for some a particular kind of person i think it's it's also ideal thank you um isola do you want to add anything well, I am in the working conditions unit so everyone is really really keen on leaving your off screen time and respecting your working hours. Although I can say that everyone is really um, always online <laughs> until like 8 p.m. Um, everyone is reachable. Um, so what I really appreciate is the, by the fact that they're really um, keen on expressing to you what your rights are. You really feel that you want to give your best 
you don't want to like lay down and sit down because it's really a group of an extraordinary group of people that really I, we deal directly, as Francesca said, with complaints from people. And I, what surprised me the most is how concerned these high EU officials, even our head of unit uh, director, uh, how concerned they are when they receive complaints from citizens and how quickly they want to act on it. They don't want to um, sit on them and they, they really want to do a great job. Uh, so I, yeah, that's it. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, Nick, do you have anything to add? Um, sorry, are we still talking about what surprised us or about the work-life balance? Yeah. Uh, yes, what surprised you the most. Um, but if you feel like answering the previous question, you can do that, of course. Uh, I can hit two birds with one stone, I think. Um, in terms of what surprised me, just like to build a bit on what Robert said, I think it's absolutely one of the most educational environments I have ever found myself in. First of all, I, I'm a bit of a news junkie, and yet I have never been reading more about news voluntarily than I am here. Because you feel that it is your responsibility um, to have an opinion and knowledge, objective knowledge, on everything, on every big major issue that is uh, that is going on, and then you have to think how does that relate to to Europe. Now that may be different compared to some uh, more technical DGs, but in the cabinets, for instance, where it really feels like they're spearheading the political effort of the European Union, it's uh, it's a very positive positive development for me professionally and personally. Also. Um, I've been in environments, professional environments, where people just see that you may or may not be a good person and a good professional, apologies, and they may try to, to pull you back. So like I've had people take credit for my work, like my, my superiors, I've had people uh, do stuff like that in earlier jobs. And yet in the commission, everyone, and I mean everyone from, from the lowest to the highest ranking official, they want to help you. They want to give you credit. So for instance, when I prepare some, uh, some brief, some report, whatever it is, and then they send it, uh, so I send it to my superior and then they share it with the rest of the cabinet. They always start the email with like, and special thanks to Nikos for this report. So this is something for me, this work culture is remarkable because you don't have that uh, competition, the toxic one that makes you think negatively and clouds your judgment as in other work experiences that I've had. Here you have this very, very uh, harmonic um, environment where everyone wants to help everyone because they understand that we're on the same boat. And for you personally, as a young professional just starting and embarking on their professional journey, they want to push you to learn more and they're forcing you in a, in a good way, let's say nudging you to, to, to read more and read about previous legislation on topics that you may be working in. And that very much relates to the work-life balance, if I'm not mistaken, what Isola mentioned, that of course, after six, you don't have to answer your email. No one is gonna tell you anything. But uh, from then on, it's up to you. You know, if, if you think I got the Blue Book traineeship and I'll go do something else after, don't answer the email. But if you wanna build connections with these people, you, you, you have to give, your absolute best. You have to give 110% and then you have to look at yourself and do a, bit, a little bit more. For instance, yesterday, 10 minutes before six, my superior calls me and she tells me she wants this report by tomorrow before nine, which is, so I finish at, at six technically and I start at nine technically. And yet she had the report in, uh, in her email at 1 a.m. in the morning. I, I did it because I had to, but no one forced me. So they told me if you could please do it, like no, no one put, uh, no one forces you to do anything. From then on, it's it's up to what you want to get out and yield from the from the traineeship that defines what sort of work life balance you have. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, we are slowly running out of time, so I'm going to move on. And I think the next question might be for Frankie. Adriana, do you want to ask it yourself? Okay, I don't want to take floor to anybody since I've already asked once. And I think it, this also is very similar to Caroline's question. 
um, basically, yeah, my, my question is what your, what the traineeship showed you in terms of what you want to do afterwards? Um, how do you want to interact with the commission, with the institution? Um, what was the factor that like persuaded you of this? And I also heard that it's really difficult to find a consecutive stable long-term position after the traineeship. So what's your view on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you can hear me. Um, so what happens is that to a certain extent, you of course you want to enjoy, you want to give your, your best and uh, do the most amazing traineeship you've ever dreamed of. But then at the same time, when uh, when the time is about to, to go by, so to say, you start looking at what's going to be next. You start trying to understand what kind of positions are in that unit or in that DG. You, you, you basically start self-promoting self -promo yourself with the head of unit. And that's basically when it starts the run for the for the cast positions, so to say. So you start doing two things, basically. You start trying to understand how the EPSO competitions work. That's something that uh, I, I'm pretty sure you've already seen. That's the general concours right now. They're a little bit changing the measures. And uh, for example, right now there have been two calls and um, half of the people that I know was basically enrolling for it. So we're all preparing those. So that's the EPSO open competition. That's the general way, the entry level, to actually uh, become uh, uh, an official, so a functionary. Then the other thing, and that's uh, actually more related to my experience, what happened to me, is uh, this invitation to the cast. It's what happens next. In my experience, actually, um, I loved my blue book, but it wasn't in my remit. I have a legal background. I wanted to do project management, program management. I wanted to do other things, absolutely other things. Uh, I was uh, working in health uh, for, and food security. I actually have a specialization in uh, youth policies and cultural policies. So what happened to me is that during my traineeship, I was the coordinator of one of the subcommittees I was mentioning before. And I've been organizing myself events. So I was trying to um, promote uh, some connections between DGs and doing something different. Um, and the good thing, as uh, the guys were saying before, is that actually I had full support of my team. They knew, so of course I was doing my job during the day for the for the blue book for the daily work. But then on the other side, I actually had my head of units and my director coming to the conferences we were organizing, and uh, one of them was actually with a commissioner. So you have a little bit uh, a way to, to move and do things also a little bit out, outside of the box. In that remit, that's what happened. I asked for them, uh, I asked for them, of course, to, to be invited for, uh, for a cast position, to, to have the possibilities, because basically when you pass this exam, that's the thing that makes you eligible to a temporary position that is not the one, of course, from the EPSO general open competition, because that's a per for a permanent official position. But the CAS, it's a contract agent position. So it's up to six years. So what happened to me basically is that I had the opportunity to uh, to do the exam. I passed it. And then, of course, once you have the piece of certificate, the certificate that says, OK, you, you can work there, you start basically the, the run, so to say. I actually, I was supposed to come back before the Blue Book. I was still in Rome. I was supposed to back to come back to Italy and uh, start uh, working in Ernest Young as a consultancy and actually working on capacity building funds for Italy and for my ministries. But then I was already in Brussels. I have already started all the networking and that's what they were saying before. I mean, it's a little bit addictive. So uh, then you start step by step. The cast, uh, even when you pass it, it's not something that happens immediately. Uh, that's why I was referring before as this uh, interim contracts. Uh, that's uh, it all. It all builds step by step with the connection with the char with what you're doing so far. But the most important thing is that really related to the thing that I was telling you before about the simple submission of the application and the resilience. So never, never stop when the threshold is too low or when uh, uh, even the first couple of interviews don't work. Just keep digging because if you're good enough in self-promoting and really just believing in yourself and what you want to do next, then that CV is actually going to go to the right pile of desk for the right head of unit and then and then they call you. Thank you very much. Um, Nick, do you want to answer what you plan to do after this, if you have any idea? Yes. Um, so I think Francesca, for uh, for someone that uh, just started their Blue Book traineeship and now is thinking 
I had, I think you gave an excellent uh, synopsis of everything. Um, in terms of everyone here in one way or another is interested in working for the commission. That's why you partook in this event. So I will tell you one thing. Um, the cast seems very intimidating as a student. And in a way it is, but don't rule out being permanent in the commission because of the cast. Don't do it because I was there exactly where you are one year ago and I was I was a bit skeptical of, of working on a permanent basis uh, in the commission of being a so-called bureaucrat because of the cast, because I was afraid of it. I'm like, I'm not just gonna finish my master's just to embark on something that is awfully similar to, to another, so to speak, executive master's. But trust me, one, once you get here, you, you get, ex uh, it's extremely exciting. You get addicted to, to the culture relatively quickly. And it, it's also a, a, a very, very fascinating, very beautiful institution. It, it is the, the policy making machine of the EU. And of course that comes with a price, which is you have to work hard. There's no easy position in the EU. From the lowest to the highest positions, everyone is working their ass off so that the EU can, can function, can have proposals and don't be afraid of that. The, the cast is something that inevitably if you do want to work, uh, you you have to do it. For instance, I know that you can also get uh, a, uh, a contractor position. So for instance, it, it can be for, for a few years, depending on what the agreement is. I, I don't exactly know the, the specifics, but I know that you can be a, as a temporary contractor in the commission uh, for for a few, for, for an extra amount of time. But if, if you really want uh, a job that's related to the EU that's, uh, that also brings stability. The, the, the pay is uh, really extra, extraordinary, especially for our current times. And considering that the Blue Book traineeship is one of the highest paid internships in, uh, in uh, Brussels, it, don't rule it out just because of, of the cast. So give yourself the benefit of the doubt in terms of what you want. And just if, if you wanna do, the EU, and if you want to do specifically the commission, do the blue book. The blue book is an excellent uh, is an excellent compass. It it will tell you your mind within a few very short weeks will tell you what it wants, and and just listen to that when the time comes. All right, thank you, Roberts. What are your plans? Uh, well, I have uh, enjoyed greatly this experience of working in, uh, at the commission and definitely I, I hold it still as a kind of possibility. Um, yeah, that perhaps I would be interested in, in continuing on uh, for long term, but for me, it's still a kind of open question whether to do this or maybe a more kind of academic path perhaps. Because in, in I think in, uh, I mean, really, those are the two things that I've experienced so far in my uh, professional life. But yeah, each one has its own kind of pluses and minuses. You know, uh, I think in commission, you definitely feel, um, yeah, like that you're working on something that has this great consequence, you know, and, and contributing to real policy uh, legislation. Um, but at the same time, I do in, appreciate greatly also in academia how I think the kind of possibilities of what you can explore, you know, perhaps, you know, there's less of a kind of a, a you know, a frame uh, around it. So I'm still thinking in between these two things. Yeah, that's totally understandable. Um, Isola? Uh, I am in the same position as Roberts. Honestly, before knowing that I was late recruited for a commission, I was full on doing a PhD. I was preparing a proposal for a PhD. Um, now that I'm experiencing the life at the European Commission, I'm like Francesca said, I think it's really addictive. Like once you're in, it's really a good place to be, where to learn and you feel like you're doing something for for like in concrete, um, so still an open question also for me. But as Francesca said, one thing that really this time of, of the year with COVID and everything really taught me is like taking it step by step. You can have many things 
on the line at the same time, like you're not rolling out anything. If, uh, as long as it like it passion like is something which you're really passionate about, you can still preparing like your uh, application for a private sector, still looking and networking inside the commission. That's I think that's that's the, the that's the trick to not exclude anything because it's really perhaps you don't get it this time. Uh, also the blue book and then perhaps you get it the second time after you had like um, other totally unrelated experience so yeah still work in progress thank you very much um we have one last question that i think is very technical so it should be brief um which would be great because we went uh, a little bit over time um grace do you want to ask it yourself Yeah, sure. Thank you. Also, thank you for coming tonight. Um, it's been really helpful to hear from you guys. I was just wondering, I do have part time work experience from my time during my undergraduate institution, but I also have um, two internship experiences that are more relevant to policymaking. So I would rather get a recommendation letter from those internships. Is that technically not allowed? Because I saw on the website that work experience is only classified to internships that are not through your university. And everything like okay. <laughs> when you, you have to you have to choose okay they usually I think it was only three tabs so you would generally just write the most important ones but really just send everything every single supportive document for every kind of language I was two two months in Peru doing volunteering but it was basically my uh, graduation trip after my diploma and I used it because I had learned somehow Spanish and you know, just put everything because then, I mean, they will interview you and you will tell them your experience and then that's going to be, it's a little bit of an outer certification, but then if you have really done these things and especially if it wasn't a non-remunerated work, work experience, but then you did learn way more things than what you were actually remunerated, then just put it because that's what they will use during their work. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're bringing this event to a close 10 minutes after seven. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you to say just one very short and brief closing remark, any words of wisdom that you wanna pass on to us as students, um, and then we'll say goodbye. Um, Roberts, do you wanna start? Yes, I think um, it's, it's definitely worth applying for the Blue Book traineeship also, of course, in these times, taking into consideration, I think for people who applied uh, for this session, I think it was something like one fifth of like the normal number of candidates who are get accepted were only accepted because of the kind of COVID, you know, all these restrictions and the fact that they allowed those who were in the, the spring session to continue on. So there's a lot of just contingencies that play a role. Uh, so be aware of it, but definitely give it a try. And I think, yeah, like uh, be honest in your applications and also as concrete as possible. Like, I think that was something that was really emphasized when we were applying to really say specifically, you know, what have you done and you know uh, which things you're interested in and yeah pursue it that way and I think yeah like uh, it's definitely definitely valuable and cool experience if you if you do do it. Thanks Isola. Yeah um, also um, don't get discouraged if you don't get in you you're still a graduate for the next session so if you graduate if you apply for this session beginning in January, I think you're still you still qualify for the June session. So don't get discouraged. Get as much as experience as experience as possible, and yeah, keep trying because it's really worth it. Thank you for those inspirational words, um, Nick. Uh, just do it, guys. It's honestly a great experience. Just go for it. Uh, don't overthink your application too much. Like Robert said, be concrete, uh, be very concise. It's uh, more important than you might think. Um, and just uh, don't, don't underestimate yourselves, but always, always operate under the assumption that everyone else is better than you because the, that will push you to try to maximize and make the most out of your, your application and just be 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 fearless go for it i will also put uh, my link 
to my LinkedIn profile. Anyone that wants to further discuss with me, I would be more than happy to, to share a virtual coffee with you guys. Thank you very much for offering help. Um, now, Frankie. Yeah, same as uh, as Nick. Uh, absolutely, feel free to contact me. I've been doing coaching sessions, uh, speaking, uh, sharing tips all the time since uh, uh, since the blue book. So really, that's that's the thing. It's uh, be, mainly follow your guts and contact people. Contact people, but also remember that doesn't exist only the European Commission. I mean, it's uh, of course it's here we were speaking about the traineeship and everything, but uh, there's a bajillion of ways to contribute to in the world. So do it, but also keep thinking outside of the box and see that everything is interrelated. Okay. And enjoy. All right. Um, all right. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy working lives to sit with us students and discuss your um, work experience. We really do appreciate it. Um, for everyone, um, attendees, but also panelists, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're active on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So stay tuned for other events because we definitely do have many exciting events uh, planned uh, for this term, but mainly for the next term as well. So thank you everyone. And I hope you enjoyed it all. Thank you. Thank you for coming guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you all. Bye-bye. Have a good evening.